was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear it and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes. And I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny St, and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Norbert Goldfield, founder and executive director of Healing Across the Divides, or HATD. Healing Across the Divides is an organization of American medical professionals who assist their Israeli and Palestinian counterparts in creating bridge building programs that improve the health of both Israelis and Palestinians. Established 17 years ago, their mission is to measurably improve the health of marginalized people living in the Palestinian territories and Israel via community-based intervention. They have funded and provided technical consultation to more than 50 community-based groups in the Palestinian territories and Israel, and they have positively impacted the health and well-being of more than 200,000 Palestinians and Israelis. By partnering with other foundations in the United States and overseas, their Israeli and Palestinian staff, board, and outside experts provide consultation to the community groups during their three-year grant cycles. This is peace building utilizing the health community as a conduit for change. Dr. Norbert Goldfill is the founder and executive director of Healing Across the Divides. He is a practicing internist at a community health center with over 30 years of experience restructuring healthcare systems, both at a national level and in community settings, as well as extensive experience working with Israelis and Palestinians. He's also an author and has published more than 50 books and articles. So let's get started. Welcome, Norbert. It's a joy to be with you and thanks so much for the opportunity. It's great to have you with us. How, how would you describe Healing Across the Divides? Well, it's interesting because our mission has remained exactly the same as it was when we first started in 2004. There's some organizations that have mission creep, they change and so on and so forth. But in part because the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has not resolved itself, and also in part because uh, we have a particular focus, which is to say that we work with community-based groups to measurably improve the health of marginalized Israelis and Palestinians. We bring them together as much as we can, but at the end of the day, our long-term hope is not only will these community groups increase their effectiveness and impact through the projects that we fund and provide technical advice for, but our dream 
maybe not in my lifetime, will be that some of these leaders of some of these groups, and they are truly amazing, will be some of tomorrow's political leaders, both in Israel and in Palestine. What are some of the initiatives that you work on? So why don't we just start with what we're currently doing? You know, the uh, in um, in Israel, we're funding a a joint farm, uh, which seems like not really related to health, but in fact, it is directly related to health because the outcome that we're looking at is improved nutrition. It's a joint farm between Israeli Bedouin and Israeli Jews in the southern part of Israel. Uh, we have another initiative working with African refugee asylum seekers. And there were about 100,000, close to 100,000 African refugee asylum seekers who are not Jewish, uh, who uh, have found their way to Israel. Uh, and there are approximately 30,000 who are still left. And we're funding an intervention that looks at storytelling to improve uh, their uh, dealing with psychic trauma uh, that has occurred to almost all the women who were sexually trafficked while they were traversing through the Sinai. And this is through an organization called Kuchinate, uh, where they're doing handcrafts and, uh, and uh, other types of artistic endeavor, craft endeavors to support themselves. So it's a combination of a mental health intervention and, a, uh, 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 and a, an economic intervention. A second example of the work that we're doing in Israel is a, a project that we're just uh, finishing up, actually, uh, working with an organization that's looking at childhood safety, uh, where they're working with the communities uh, to uh, uh, Im improve the childhood safety uh, in the home. So we're looking particularly in domestic uh, accidents that, are, that occur in the, in the home. In the... Um, in the West Bank, we're funding an initiative that looks at uh, diabetes uh, using um, uh, a program that was developed at Stanford uh, called Chronic Disease Self-Management, uh, and which is a lay-led intervention. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's one example. Uh, the, another example is a program that's occurring in one of the refugee camps uh, called Kalandia, that's just starting uh, the, um, uh, a program that's looking at improved nutrition uh, in, uh, for, uh, for uh, families, children, and, and, the, uh, and the entire family looking at improved nutrition. That actually just started just a few weeks ago. That's exciting. Yeah, you have just so many wonderful projects. Um, what are your goals? The goal that is, uh, goes back to the mission and how we accomplish our mission, uh, which is to say uh, we specifically and only fund community-based groups, both in Israel and in Palestine. We only fund community-based groups. We don't do the work ourselves. Um, and secondly, uh, what we clearly want to accomplish at a minimal, at a minimum is measurable improvement in health for the people that are served by these community groups. And then, as I indicated, we have much bigger dreams, uh, as we hope uh, that some of, as I indicated, that even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, uh, certainly some of the leaders of some of these groups are just amazing. And uh, I know that some of them could easily be some of tomorrow's political leaders. So how many uh, grants uh, do you give and uh, about how much are they? Sure. So we, anywhere between six to 10 grants, which range from anywhere from 10 to $50,000 per year for three years. And uh, these, they're three-year grant cycles. The idea is in the first year, they kind of test out uh, what they're uh, trying to accomplish. Uh, then if it works, the second year is to go, go full throttle and really try to implement it. And the third year is to continue it while we, they start to work with us and others to try to see about possibly uh, getting some additional funds because these are three-year grants. Awesome. Uh, before we go much further, I wanted to um, show a uh, clip 
of some of your work to get a better understanding of the terrific projects that HATD supports. So why don't we take a look at that? In 2019, HATD funded its first project in Gaza. Diabetes Palestine utilizes the evidence-based chronic disease self-management program a comprehensive approach developed at Stanford University to help young people with type 1 diabetes. Like the first point that I wanted to like to say about the program is the teamwork that we had. It's like the first time since I like since I was diagnosed with diabetes that I've seen a, like people work as a team uh, regarding helping adolescents with diabetes. And I, and I love the program because it focused on things that uh, us in the Arab world don't talk about that much. When we when we talk about the psychosocial aspect of diabetes, when you talk about like your mental health, um, people in the Arab world or the, like here in the Middle East um, don't talk about those things that much. It's only about uh, what you eat. It's only about how much you exercise. Uh, so we don't they don't focus um, on other other factors that affect your affect your diabetes. The Terra, known as Safe Kids Israel in English illustrates two of the goals of HATD, saving lives through direct intervention and empowering women. Working to decrease rates of child accidents and fatalities, which are especially high in Arab and Jewish Orthodox communities. In the village of Turan, which is a low income Israeli Arab community, our grantee, Beterim, trained local senior women to remedy in-home problems in child safety. The initiative examined the effectiveness of a home visit intervention program, providing an evidence-based child safety intervention. For example, once trained, a grandmother would do an audit in a home looking at possible danger points for children. The fact that grandmothers were the ones teaching families about what they can do to reduce childhood injuries, accompanied by the appreciation of the population, generated a lot of pride and respect in the village. The program was extremely successful. These efforts garnered Beterim two prizes in recognition of the accomplishments of this initiative. The 2018 Israeli Minister of Welfare Award and the second prize for excellence in home safety at the 2017 Safe Kids Worldwide Childhood Injury Prevention Convention. The next video is of White Hill Farms, a project of HATD that brings together Jews and Bedouin Arabs in neighboring communities in the Negev. The goals for this project are to improve health, raise awareness around nutrition and the environment, and coexistence. The White Hill Farm, um, here the, the first slide shows you, this was a piece of desert that the uh, municipality, it was a dream that our, our um, Bedouin neighbors and, and Jews from Yerucham had for about five years now. And then we started discussing the possibility of having a place where we could raise vegetables and connect with each other and learn about um, healthy lifestyles, but also connecting to nature and, and responsibility for the desert that we love and share. These are just some of the um, uh, pictures of the life at the farm where what we decided when we saw that it was very, very difficult for cultural and logistic reasons to bring um, women, for instance, uh, Jewish and Bedouin women at the same time to the farm to uh, promote family plots. We, we brought kindergarten children with the idea that at the early ages, if we uh, break down stereotypes and create um, opportunities for getting to know each other and also teach about healthy lifestyles, it can uh, affect also uh, the, the parents and the families. And um, just to show you uh, cauliflower, zucchini, tomatoes, um, they're all the signs of the vegetables are in Arabic and Hebrew. Um, these are pictures that Tisham Ibsan sent me of shakshuka and healthy breakfast with cauliflower and tomato casseroles and things like that. And all of the pita is with uh, whole wheat flour. 
the story of the farm and the communities of Yerucham and Rachma working together was picked up by Israeli television. Here is the program. This small farm on the outskirts of Yerucham is a perfect example of the coexistence between the two settlements. We can see Jewish and Bedouin children playing together and sharing different experiences. Before the coronavirus pandemic, people from Yerucham arrived here three times a week. There is also a joint robotic class for Rachme and Yerucham, and there are many other activities. The children enjoy it a lot. This initiative has a great value from different aspects, educational, environmental, and also political. It brings us together with our neighbors, connect us to the earth, and also add some educational values which our children don't get in school. What attracted me to, to Yerucham was that it's like a microcosm of Israeli society, and it's a place where you're what I see is the real Israel, where you're not in a Anglo bubble or a, a circle of uh, people who are similar to you, uh, but it's a place where you meet Israel in all its incredible diversity with the challenges and also with incredible people who are really trying to uh, figure out how to live together in the best way possible. Well, that's really uh, terrific uh, programs that you have. Um, HATD does incredible work, and besides being an internist, as we've said, you've also written many books, and one came out last year called Peace Building Through Women's Health. Um, we spoke recently on Peace with Penny with two women's peace organizations, uh, Itach Maki, Women's Lawyers for Social Justice, and Shin, the Israeli Movement for Equal Representation of Women. Um, and uh, I'm interested now in what you've written about the impact on peace through women's health. So if you could please tell us about it and uh, why you decided to write this book. Yeah, the reality is, is that uh, women are the most discriminated against people in the world. It's as simple as that. On the other hand, on the other hand if you empower women, you don't just empower themselves. You, uh, uh, you also empower the whole family and you engage with the whole community. So that's what's, what's dramatic about engaging with women. Uh, the, uh, the book itself is essentially a, the story of healing across the divides placed into a much wider framework. So there are introductory and concluding chapters. Uh, that uh, pertain to, at the end of the day, the fact that, uh, as Rashid Khalidi uh, stated in a recent book, uh, what we have in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are two nationalisms that are competing to live on the same land. And so the question is, is whether or not uh, there are people who can uh, appreciate that there are these two nationalisms and can somehow find accommodation. We, so speaking for myself, I as an American uh, can't do that. So instead of, uh, though I wish I could, I wish I was one of those 10 or 15 people who could work from the top down, but we work from the bottom up. We work through community groups. These community groups are led by women almost exclusively, but not completely. Uh, and our hope and our aim is to empower these groups uh, but at a minimum, and this is what we've seen, is to measurably improve the health of hundreds of thousands of marginalized Israelis and Palestinians. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, one of the, your many wonderful projects is you just got back from your 2022 study tour. Can you talk about what that is and and what what a study tour is, who takes you on it, what and, and what the purpose is. So the study tour is really the best way for anyone to get a, a feeling or a sense as to what's going on with the grantees. And at the same time, eat great food. Uh, mm. Israel and Palestine is just simply spectacular. Uh, and see wonderful sights. Um, the uh, study tour is once a year. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it during COVID, but we had one just now, it just finished. And uh, I was really 
uh, to put it in a positive way, obsessing to make sure that, as you can see, that uh, except when we're eating, everybody's wearing masks. Uh, and uh, we wanted to be sure that anybody who we met with was tested beforehand. And I'm happy to say that no one got COVID. Uh, hey. All these study tours uh, where, or cruises or whatever, where people, you know, uh, get, uh, get COVID. And mm -hmm. that's an issue that if I could avoid, I wanted to do that. But the sure. that the, uh, the study tour, in addition to seeing grantees, in addition to everything else I mentioned, it's what's called a, new, a dual narrative study tour, which is to say there's an Israeli guide and a Palestinian guide. And this is done in, in, under the auspices of a wonderful tour operator called Mejdi, M-E-J, rather, B-I, Mejdi Tours. Mm -hmm. And there's an Israeli and a Palestinian guide who basically give you know, their perspectives from their cultures, their nationalisms uh, on the same events, on the same... Uh, on the same land, which can be quite different. Again, the question is, is how there can be accommodation between these two populations. So that's what you get a really clear sense of. And we spend time in Israel, we spend time all over the West Bank, all over Israel, and uh, people come away uh, seeing amazing people uh, and feeling good in their stomach and having seen amazing sights. And who, who's going on these tours? So the people from all over the United States, most recently, for example, we have people from Texas, Indiana, uh, uh, Mar uh, Maryland, Massachusetts. These are, some are health professionals, some are not. Uh, some have never been to the region. Some have been many times. Uh, and, uh, and I can say that uh, some of the people who have been many times, for example, to Israel, have come on two of the study tours uh, because clearly we have new grantees uh, to showcase each time. So it's a whole range of people with a whole range of backgrounds uh, and a whole range of interests, but who at a minimum are curious and are interested in trying to understand what's going on in a conflict, which is one of the longest running conflicts in the world today. And are uh, they from different religions as well? Yeah, yeah, good point, good question. Christians, Muslims, Jews, uh, uh, atheists or agnostics, Mm -hmm. uh, we have every every um, uh, 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 religious uh, background or non-religious background. Well, I see that you're enjoying some wonderful food, and it's making me hungry. So I think I want to move on to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Oh, um, you have uh, this. Uh, a uh, project called Yes Drama Therapy. Can you explain what exactly that is? Yeah, so there's uh, an intervention, a uh, form of mental health therapy, essentially. Uh, there are many different types of mental health therapy. It's a type of therapy, frankly, that I didn't know too much about until the proposal came in. The way we operate is that we decide, you know, what kind of funds we have available. Uh, mm -hmm. We may put out a call for proposals if we haven't mm -hmm. spent yet and this uh, this proposal came in uh, that uh, uh, for for an initiative called drama therapy which works with um, Palestinians in Hebron and mm -hmm. the South Hebron Hills uh, so where there's a, a fair amount of tension uh, and um, both of those areas uh, but this is specifically with Palestinians asking the question as to how, in essence, they can deal with some of the uh, challenges they have with their everyday lives. Uh, and it's been quite successful. Uh, uh, and we've, uh, in fact, looking to the possibility of identifying a, a partner in Israel to see if they might be able to continue uh, in some form, because we're always looking for sustainability. Mm -hmm. Well, that looks like... Uh... Well, there's so many issues there that uh, it, that would be helpful. Th those are teens, am I correct? The, right. Those are teens. Right. So there's teens, young mothers uh, who are participants, um, and, uh, and both teenage boys and girls. And this, I think in this photograph uh, that everybody sees, it's just uh, only mm -hmm. women. Uh, but there's both uh, boys and girls, teenagers, and young mothers who are participating. Hmm. And uh, you have 
a number of groups that have uh, worked on ending domestic violence against women and girls. Can you talk about them? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, similar to the situation in the United States, at the synagogue, which I've been president of, you know, has uh, has in the men's bathroom, uh, is, you know, quite, uh, you know, who to contact in terms of there's the domestic violence. Unfortunately, domestic violence is ever present in every society, going back to the point that I made before, that's just a manifestation of the fact that women are truly the most discriminated against people in the world. And we have several different initiatives uh, in, the, in the area of domestic violence. You know, one in Israel and one in, the, uh, one in the West Bank. The one in the West Bank was, uh, was quite, quite interesting. Uh, uh, the low-income populations everywhere are often more obese, are in fact more obese uh, than people who are middle class or upper class. Uh, that obesity uh, is, a, is a health issue. And the uh, Family Defense Society in a program that is completed, but was very successful, they wanted to identify obese uh, Palestinian women uh, as, as a way as, a, as to identify people who are at risk for domestic violence. Why were they interested in the topic? because they operated the first domestic violence shelter in, uh, in, um, in the West Bank. And what they did then is uh, worked on this same Stanford program that you heard that was being implemented in Gaza, which is this chronic disease self-management program. And in this case, with the Family Defense Society, it was pertaining to obesity. And what they did was they worked with women on obesity and then identified women who were at the same time at risk uh, for domestic violence as one form of intervention. A second- Is there some kind of correlation between ob obesity and domestic violence? That's a good question. It's not so much the correlation between the two, but oftentimes people who are obese, there's a correlation between that and depression. Not always, I want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll be seeing patients all day tomorrow as an internist. So uh, uh, some individuals who are obese uh, uh, have a propensity towards depression. And the question is, is why are they depressed? And to mm -hmm. identify those, in, those women who, who may, have, uh, uh, may have elements or aspects of either physical or, and or psychological abuse. That's, that's unfortunately prevalent and hard to hear. Uh, um, and then you uh, empower women through many health initiatives. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Sure. Uh, we funded an Orthodox uh, Jewish, uh, several Orthodox Jewish interventions and um, that pertain to issues of breast cancer. Uh, and uh, there was uh, a hesitancy, less so today, but still present, uh, among some Orthodox Jewish women uh, who were uh, concerned that if, if um, they were found out that they had the breast cancer gene or the BRCA gene, uh, that mm -hmm. their would be less marriageable. Uh, and so we funded two different interventions, one in B'nai Brak, one in, uh, in, uh, in a uh, part of Jerusalem. Uh, that, um, and the intervention was working with community health workers all of whom were Orthodox Jewish women, on an intervention to in increase mammography rates. Uh, the mm -hmm. program was so successful uh, that, in fact, uh, not only uh, uh, were uh, several rabbis uh, uh, promulgated edicts saying that women should participate and should be engaged, not only with the community health workers who are Orthodox Jewish women very satisfied with the work, but in fact, two of the managed organizations and Israeli healthcare system is very much operated uh, through uh, uh, managed care organizations. Two of the main managed care organizations adopted the program. And so that's one aspect of empowering women through health initiatives as, as, uh, as an example. There are many more, but that's a good way to start. Fantastic. And here we have um, it's very interesting. The African uh, refugee asylum seekers, that's a whole issue and a half, I think, in Israel. Can you talk about the population, the culture, and 
how they're received and uh, what you try to help them with. Yeah, so this is a, a group of approximately, um, initially about 80,000 uh, black Africans from Eritrea, Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, who are fleeing either the genocide uh, in Darfur or incredibly repressive regimes in, in either Ethiopia or Eritrea. And they were told that uh, if they made it to Israel, you know, that they could somehow uh, uh, get out uh, of their, their very difficult situation. Unfortunately, uh, the situation was uh, not that simple in Israel. Uh, virtually no one uh, in is Israel who is an African refugee asylum seeker uh, has uh, received a political asylum, just a very less than 10, in fact. But the wow. Why is the that? Well, the reality is the state of Israel does not want these African refugee asylum seekers to be integrated into uh, Israeli society. They're not Jewish. Ah. Uh, the, uh, they are extremely discriminated against. They are in many ways the, uh, the most discriminated against uh, people uh, in Israel. Um, the approximately 50,000 have received uh, resettled in Canada, the US and the European Union but there's still about 30,000 left and Healing Cost Divides has always funded over the last few years, uh, at least one program uh, pertaining to African refugee asylum seekers. Uh, I myself uh, am a child of Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. and there's a wonderful photograph that I have in my home, which I can simply describe of uh, 10 individuals, five Holocaust survivors interlocking arms with five refugee asylum seekers. And unfortunately, uh, the refugee asylum seekers in Israel are extremely mis uh, and um, and extremely discriminated against. Uh, but the bottom line is is that we continue to support at least one program. Uh, the most recent program that we're supporting is a, an organization called Kuchinata uh, that works with um, uh, economic empowerment of women. Again, another aspect of uh, of empowering women. Clearly, economic needs are important. There's also psychic trauma that these women have uh, have experienced uh, with uh, uh, a large percentage of them having been sexually trafficked in the Sinai on their way to uh, to Israel. They have their own difficulties of all sorts of challenges within Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. And the intervention that we're funding with Kuchinata is a combination of, of uh, storytelling uh, and, uh, and uh, partly uh, the economic empowerment, which is through making of crafts and art. Hmm. It seems like you've got quite a cross-section of cultures that you work with. Can you talk about the different ones that you work with? I think we've, we've worked with virtually every culture uh, in the region. Uh, we have funded initiatives uh, with Ethiopian Jews. Uh, so these are uh, individuals from Ethiopia who are Jewish. So they're full uh, of Israel, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, they're extremely, extremely discriminated against in large measure because they're black. Uh, so unfortunately, Still. Mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, as often, unfortunately, blacks in this country, uh, but blacks in Ethiopia, uh, uh, blacks in Israel, even if they're Jewish, uh, are discriminated against. And what's amazing is that that uh, there was no diabetes in Ethiopia. Uh, for all practical purposes. And the, now that they've resettled in Israel, uh, they have a completely different lifestyle. They're extremely mm -hmm. poor on average. So they're very, also very marginalized, not as poor as African refugee asylum seekers, who again are not Jewish, but they're very mm -hmm. poor. And that 0% of diabetes has ballooned to 15% uh, wow. out of obesity. And so we've worked with several different initiatives working on uh, diabetes and Ethiopian Jews. Uh, but mm -hmm. we've worked with uh, every different ethnic group. We've certainly worked with uh, uh, Sephardic Jews. The, the farm that I described before, that was this mm -hmm. film clip, is uh, almost all uh, Sephardic Jews who are living in uh, Yerucha. Hmm. And uh, 
you also are dealing with uh, Bedouins? Yes. Uh, so we've several programs. The most recent program that just uh, finishing up is the joint farm between mostly Sephardic Jews, but not exclusively, in Yerucham and Bedouin in the uh, what, what is called the unrecognized village of Rachma. And unrecognized means that they get no services, um, municipal services like garbage disposal, uh, running water, or anything of the nature. And so what's been very good, and the White Hill Farm that we have funded for the last few years has been part of it, not the only part at all, but been part of, of bringing these two communities together. And part of the uh, outcome of these two communities is not just improved nutrition, which is one of the outcomes that they're looking at, but improved communication. And mm -hmm. what's resulted in is that improved communication has resulted in the, uh, Yero, the Jews of Yerucham lobbying the Israeli government to offer rec recognition and recognized status for the unrecognized village of Rachma. And so that's a beginning, uh, a process that takes a long time. But the first step has already occurred, which means that in fact, we were there in, um, uh, in the most recently in, in March on our study tour, we saw an elementary school that was just built uh, and it was just open a few months ago uh, for the unrecognized village of Rachman. And hopefully that will only increase. But that's part of the outcome of the improved communication between the Sephardic Jews and uh, Jews of Yerucham and the Israeli Bedouin. And your projects with the Palestinians? So the Palest uh, Palestinians, the interventions that we're currently funding, we've already mentioned the Yes Theater mm -hmm. uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, mentioned also briefly the project on the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the refugee camp, a mm -hmm. brand new initiative also that just started in December, is uh, is with uh, an Israeli organization where the director is uh, Jewish and they this organization called Ladat uh, is working with Palestinian women in East Jerusalem on issues of uh, reproductive rights and sexuality and um, it was very interesting you know the uh, during the study tour uh, we met with uh, with this group and we met with two Palestinian women who were working on the project and the Israeli Jewish director and uh, uh, one of the uh, people in the study tour asked, well, you know, sometimes these days there's less and less interaction uh, between uh, Palestinians and Jews, between Palestinians, you know, in the, in the West Bank or Palestinians in East Jerusalem mm -hmm. and Jews in Jerusalem or in Israel, you know, give us your take on that. And the response for me was just, you know, rather dramatic. And that is to say, you know, you're right. There is increasing tension. You're right. There is less communication. But you know what? We are women first. And that overrides everything. And we are working on issues that are of great concern to women. And we're pleased to be working on this initiative. Just an amazing group of women. Yes, I've seen that um, uh, just speaking today or with um, the issue of the environment as well you know, in the area, the fact that, uh, you know, the environment doesn't realize if you're Israeli or Palestinian or Jordanian, you know, living in the same area, <laughs> it sometimes helps to work on an issue that you're all concerned of. And, uh, you know, you're also working on peace because you're learning how to get along and hear others' opinions, et cetera, from very divergent uh, opinions so it's uh what whatever makes it happen is terrific what what work do you do with actually jewish israelis so i've already mentioned uh the mm -hmm. uh the some of the projects uh, I right i I'm, i was really curious what what is the cause i know you've got this terrific uh project with the grandmothers and teaching safety is it because the Orthodox have so many children? What What is causing um, so many safety issues? The combination uh, of lots of children, but more importantly, is poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so you have unfinished banisters, you know, and, mm -hmm. and there's also uh, the issue of engagement, education. Uh, so the uh, child safety project that I highlighted, 
that was uh, uh, mentioned in the in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That has that has been implemented. It's just finishing up now, but that has been implemented in a number of places, including the Palestinian town, Israeli uh, Palestinian or Israeli Arab towns of Turan and Um Al Fahim, and in the Jewish towns uh, of Carmiel and in the uh, Orthodox Jewish section of Haifa. Um, so, uh, so it's been implemented in four sites, two Jewish and two non-Jewish uh, sites. And I should point out, we have, uh, which we haven't mentioned so far, we have a, a representative in Israel who's Jewish and a representative in the West Bank who's uh, uh, Palestinian and is Muslim. And we, of course, meet as staff every two to three weeks. And that's another way. Uh, for Jews and uh, and Palestinians to to engage with each other. How would you describe your supporters, and how many of them do you have? So our supporters are all, almost all individual supporters in the United States. Uh, the um, uh, throughout the United States, we have hundreds of supporters from all over the United States, from uh, New York City to Los Angeles, from Seattle to Florida, uh, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, but it's not, but, uh, we're just so pleased, uh, that we have these individual supporters from all over the United States. And, um, uh, that's, that's how we operate. You've got, uh, quite a budget. <laughs> well, our budget is modest, which is to say oh, well. about 400,000 a year. Uh, that, uh, to some of us, that sounds big. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's that's uh, uh, at all. Uh, what what it is big in the sense that one can fund amazing numbers of community health projects. Uh, mm -hmm. because community health is inexpensive, uh, so uh, that's that's what you really can do. And we believe in health. We believe that community health, working from the bottom up, is an important part of peace building but that also leads to measurable improvement in health and is inexpensive. So what did COVID do to your programs? Depends on the program. Some of them just flourished. So for example, we, uh, in the film clip, you saw the um, uh, uh, teenagers, mm -hmm. the uh, chronic disease self-management. Well, they switched completely to WhatsApp and mm -hmm. other communication by telephone. And mm -hmm. the teachers loved it. They'd much rather be on that than meeting, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. on, on the other hand, uh, that the farm did not do so well. So, mm. because basically it was shut down. You mm. couldn't, you know, the Israeli Jews and the uh, the uh, Israeli Arabs together, there would there be different waves of COVID hitting different populations at different times. So it really depends on the, on the, uh, on the initiative. I'd say on average, most of them did just fine, but my own style is to be transparent. Most mm -hmm. of them, but some such as the program in the, in the, with the farm, mm -hmm. it's definitely not easy at all. So because many Israelis or Palestinians don't speak each other's languages, how do you deal with that? Good question. Uh, so that what I find is that, um, Certainly, the leaders in Israel of the initiatives, whether they be Israeli, Arab, or Palestinian, and the uh, Jewish, they all speak Hebrew. But it's for sure the participants in the mm -hmm. programs very often do not, for example, speak the dominant language in Israel, which is Hebrew. Mm -hmm. In the West Bank, it's all in Arabic. Right. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, much simpler. But the leaders of any of the community groups that we're funding in Israel all speak Hebrew. So what would you consider some of your greatest accomplishments for your organization? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's, what's great is when, uh, when initiatives can be uh, taken over, and several of the initiatives have been taken over. I already highlighted uh, some of them. Uh, there was a, a prenatal care intervention. Uh, that was taken over by the Israeli government uh, that worked out, you know, very well. And similarly, uh, uh, other interventions uh, have been taken over. On the other hand, in the West Bank, 
the reality is, is that the economy is very much a donor-based economy. It's not a functioning economy. There's really not a functioning healthcare system in the, uh, in the West Bank. There's sort of different like micro health systems and it, sustainability is more difficult. In fact, it's a practically impossible. We continue to work together with the grantees to try to see what we can do, but it's always very, very challenging. Uh, for sure. That said, the reality is, is that uh, the, uh, we work with a grantee uh, to measurably improve the health uh, of, uh, of uh, the participants. And one, gra one grantee that was not able to continue uh, was, uh, did an intervention on drug abuse in teens in East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Incredible impact, several thousand participants um, good impact in terms of the outcomes. Uh, and one sometimes has to be satisfied with the outcomes that one achieves the grant cycle. And we've done that for all practical purposes every time, though I want to also make sure we are a risk-taking organization. Not every grant works. And if after, mm -hmm. you, you know, the it seems that it's not working, that's okay too. But the vast majority of the interventions has resulted in a measurable improvement in health and as I just gave the example of the drug abuse intervention, or the one that you heard about in terms of diabetes. Mm -hmm. and You've done a lot of work with HIV and AIDS too, correct? Yeah, yes. Uh, so there's an initiative that we did with African refugee asylum seekers on HIV uh, in Israel. A uh, significant issue, a significant problem. Excuse me. Labriut or, uh, oh, or bless you. Um, the... Uh, and that was a very successful intervention, uh, but again, very challenging uh, because African refugee asylum seekers, as I've already pointed out, uh, mm -hmm. are not uh, able to get uh, healthcare services like Israelis, Israeli citizens are. And so this is a much more hit and miss as to what kind of medication uh, could be provided. Almost always second tier medication for HIV, but there was a whole intervention that was quite successful to try to uh, engage from a uh, sense of well-being and a sense of change in behavior. I had uh, read in uh, various documents uh, that uh, you've provided training and technical support valued at over $600,000 to your community groups you work with. That's fabulous. Um, what, what type of training and technical support? Hmm. So the biggest area that we uh, work with is both, uh, is one of two. Number one is the evaluations themselves. So uh, when the Defense Society that I highlighted before mm -hmm. uh, uh, made their proposal on issues of, of obesity, we said, mm -hmm. you know, why not uh, consider this chronic disease self-management program as an, uh, as an opportunity? And not only did they think that that was a great idea, we then worked with them to identify the, the uh, uh, instruments, the evaluation tools that they would utilize. Mm -hmm. or take the example that I spoke about just a minute ago about drug abuse for teens in East Jerusalem. The, uh, the organization was a, was a strong organization, a good organization. They were going to implement uh, a, a program called DARE, uh, which was basically... Mm -hmm a program that was uh, shown to not only not decrease drug use, but actually increase drug, uh, drug use. Really? And so it's not a validated program, but we said, look, you know, you're a good organization. Let's work together uh, and identify an approach. And we had access to the, some of the best experts in the world on drug abuse. They identified a program called Unplugged that has been mm -hmm. translated and validated in Arabic. And mm -hmm were able to get a hold of the one person who was trained in Unplug, who was an Egyptian psychiatrist who was living in Dubai at the time, and he did the training by Skype. This was uh, 10 years ago. So wow. our, work is, uh, our work is both to identify a great organization, to, uh, to, re uh, to uh, give them a grant, uh, to help them identify the best way to approach what they want to accomplish, to evaluate it, and both of our representatives in Israel and, and, the, uh, and in Palestine are also available to do management consulting on any issues that come from a management perspective. Well, 
Well, I know you're scientists or you, your background is in science and you like stats and all that, but do you have any stories about, you know, people that you've worked with and how you've helped them? I would say that so many, you know, that's what's amazing, but let me just give you one. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I was doing training. I'm a master trainer in this program called Chronic Disease self Management at Stanford uh, and uh, uh, by a, a colleague named Professor uh, Kate Lord. And I was doing training of a new group in, um, in, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, and so I was, I do not speak Arabic. Uh, mm -hmm. I was working with the English language version. They were working with the Arabic language version. And a very big part of this training, it's a very intensive training, is you basically, they start teaching very quickly. And there was um, a woman uh, who was very clearly a, an amazing teacher. I could see it. And I, I started to talk with her uh, through a translator. And um, she speaks some English, so she understands quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and never worked in her life uh, but wanted to you know somehow I'd heard about this and was working through this community group and then what happened was is not only uh, did she become trained in chronic disease self-management she began to work uh, with another community group they put a proposal and this was her first job she had been a mother for decades you know and she became director of the program well then she definitely worked <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I, I would say most people have worked very hard all their lives. They don't always get paid for it, though. Absolutely good point, and I appreciate it. But she was not outside the home. Uh, yes. This was her first job outside the home, and, uh, and she was just an amazing person and was so engaged with the work, so appreciative of the work, uh, and very much... Uh, 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 very much part of the new leadership that, as far as I'm concerned, is the kind of leadership that I think uh, uh, both Israel and, and Palestine, you know, uh, certainly uh, uh, can benefit from. Well, I always like to talk to the people that I interview about uh, what got them interested in these endeavors. Um, I know you have a fascinating uh, personal story, even from the time you were born, et cetera. So let, let, let's start there. Where were you born? I was born in Florence, Italy. I speak Italian fluently. My first language was Italian. And I'll never forget the day when I came to the United States when I was just over five and I was just shocked. I could not speak a word of English. And I was trying to speak to my aunt, who could not speak Italian, uh, and uh, uh, and so it was definitely a shock to me. But of course, I learned English very fast, uh, and I've lived in the United States uh, uh, since then. But I've gone back to Italy, you know, virtually every year, and I've worked in Italy mm. in a variety of different capacities. So, are there very many Italian Jews? There are not a lot of Italian Jews. My mother was a Florentine Jew. My father was an Austrian Jew who, uh, as he said, found himself to be lucky enough to be in Italy during World War II, which was very difficult. And of course, uh, a fair number of the Italian Jews were killed. Wasn't he in a concentration camp of in sorts? In, in Italy, yes, uh, and several. Uh, but they were not death camps, but still not, uh, not a hotel by any stretch yeah. of the Yeah. Um, a lot of suffering, a lot of malaria, um, but he survived. And my mother was in hiding uh, in Tuscany. She was from Florence, uh, and um, they met after the war. And I was born uh, uh, after the war, and uh, and then we came to the United States uh, uh, and uh, lived in the United States, as I said, uh, the rest of my life. I love the United States, so, but of course, I'm happy to go back to Italy at least once a year. I don't blame you. <laughs> you speak lots of languages. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, not as many as I'd like. Uh, you know, I do speak Italian, uh, Spanish, a little bit of French, and, and English. 
I, I've gone to Ulpan to learn Hebrew twice, but uh, with my family that I have in, uh, in Israel, they sort of gave up on trying to speak with me. So look, just speaking with <laughs> right. Oops. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, all languages. You have to, pra you have, to have somebody to practice them with. So that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it, just the fact that you attempted it is fantastic. So why did you found Healing Across the Divides? So I'm one of those people that recognizes that, first of all, all Americans, whether they know it or not, are involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel is the largest recipient of foreign aid uh, from the United States. Egypt is the second largest recipient of foreign aid. And so all Americans are very much involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and in addition, I feel as an American and as a Jew that my faith is somehow tied to what's going on in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, I uh, started, I visited Israel for the first time in 1967 after the 64. I worked at Hadassah Hospital in uh, 1980 for several months uh, when I went over for several months with my uh, newly uh, um, wife that I was newly married to. Uh, then I came with both kids. Uh, I have a 39-year-old and a 34-year-old now, but we went to 1996 with Jerusalem. And that's when I started working uh, uh, from an internal medicine point of view in the West Bank. And I started thinking about ways, and I've always thought about ways of how I could be engaged in the uh, uh, in a positive way, in a measurable way, in a concrete way, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And as I've already highlighted, even though I wish I was, I'm not one of the 10 or 15 people who could make a difference from the top down. So I work from the bottom up. I work in healthcare. There's no other initiative that works with Israelis and Palestinians. So I founded Healing Cross the Divides in 2004, and we're still strong and going, and we're happy to be doing the work that we're doing. It's a fantastic organization, obviously. Um, really, as your last question, what do you see as the strongest growing medical needs in Israel and in the Palestinian territories that healing across the divides can help with during the next five years, say? Right. So the biggest issues that confront, uh, uh, from a community health perspective, that confront uh, Israelis and Palestinians who are marginalized are in many ways the challenges that um, uh, that, affle that afflict uh, marginalized people everywhere, except that it's compounded by the fact that there's an ongoing conflict. Uh, certainly we, we read, those of us who read the local newspapers, you know, in the region hear about an Israeli or a Palestinian who are killed almost every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so there's the, the diseases of poverty are exacerbated by the uh, by the ongoing conflict, uh, and those are mental health in area, mental health, uh, diabetes diseases, cancer, breast cancer, uh, in particular on both sides of the uh, of the aisle, with the with rates that are increasing. Um, so it's it's unfortunately. Diseases of poverty exacerbated by the diseases of war. And the two, fortunately, make a soup that, uh, that is really very challenging, but one that we can rise up to in a, in a modest but concrete way. Yeah, uh, I would imagine the PTSD is, the whole nation has it, I would think. Depends on, certainly, certainly numbers, uh, the... Uh, the uh, that have been identified, uh, certainly as it pertains to the marginalized and the poor on both sides. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that's a situation that exists for the African refugee asylum seekers. It certainly exists for the, uh, the Palestinians that are being worked with through Yes Theater uh, in both Hebron and in particular the South Hebron Hills, uh, there where there's a, there's a town there that could be evacuated or displaced as new refugees uh, due to a Supreme Court decision that was just announced last week. Right. Well, at times, uh, you know, I, I'm not certain I recovered from, from our trip in 2014. 
uh, uh, running to bomb shelters, uh, feeling the percussion of the exploding bombs, even though it's in the air and it could be miles away, you feel it on your skin. Mm -hmm. It's it it <laughs> it gets your attention, and uh, um, it it just I mean it did something to me for sure. But you know, living with that happening so often i just can't even imagine um what that does to people mm -hmm. um, anyway but thanks so much for your time today norbert it's great to hear about an organization that helps israelis and palestinians work together for the health of their communities next week we'll be on vacation and in the following week we begin a two-part series with the Eastern Mediterranean International School, or EMIS, which brings together Israeli Jews and Arabs, Palestinians, and international students from across national and cultural divides for a life-changing high school experience. EMIS is a nonprofit founded in 2014 and is home to 190 students. 20% are Israeli Jews and Arab. 20% come from Arab and Muslim nations, and 60% hail from 40 other countries around the world. Each brings their own identity and perspective, and together they weave a colorful tapestry that welcomes difference while finding common ground. Students live and learn together for two years in a vibrant community that celebrates pluralism, nurtures entrepreneurship, and fosters outstanding academic skills. As you can see, many people are working very hard to improve the lives of Jewish, Arab, and Palestinian people in the Middle East, promoting cooperation. And Peace with Penny strives to get the word out that there is hope for peace in the region. We'd love for you to join us again, and we hope this situation will calm down in Israel and that there'll be better news for the people of Ukraine and Russia. For now, we'll leave you as we pray that everyone will someday live in peace, shalom, and salam.